Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. I failed to mention in our prayer time, uh, Jake and Laura Bennett's baby, uh, baby girl, Lyndon, uh, is, was in the hospital uh, last uh, several days, came home over the weekend, goes back again tomorrow. There seems to be, or checking out to see if there's a, a problem with the gallbladder and uh, maybe the liver, so we need to uh, keep Lyndon before the Lord, and they'll do a series of more tests uh, again uh, tomorrow, hopefully uh, more definitive. So let's keep them before the Lord. Ephesians chapter, fo- uh, chapter 4. As we look at the book of Ephesians, we need to remember it was a letter written to the church, and the first three chapters deals with doctrine. Now he begins to deal with conduct. How does the church conduct itself? What is the church? How do the people within the church, how they respond, and, and what do they do? What is, the, what is the church's responsibility? Chapter 1, or chapter 4, in the first three verses, we'll begin there. Paul says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We'll stop there for just a moment and, and uh, comment, and then we'll pick up again from the Scripture. And what Paul is doing here is begging the individuals within the church to walk worthy of who they say they are. He said, you say that you are a believer. You say that you're Christian. You say that you have been redeemed by Jesus Christ. He said, Let, let's walk that way. Let's walk as you say that you are. The word worthy is a word that means equal weight in the Greek. And the believer's calling and the believer's conduct needs to be equal. It needs to be the same, how you walk and what you say. In other words, you just, just walk worthy of who you say that you are. So not only is our calling the calling of our salvation, but it is also a calling into the union that believers are to have with each other that the apostle is ready to present to us. A believer's conduct concerns both his personal life and his responsibility to other believers. So when we trust Christ as Savior, it's not the fact that we're saved and that we're only concerned about ourselves and how we live, but our conduct involves that which affects other individuals as well. And then Paul lists for us three virtues that strengthen us in our Christian walk and how we draw to the Lord. Let's look at these very briefly. First of all, he talks about the lowliness or the word is humility. In the Greek culture, humility was, was a word that w- it was really a, a negative word. It was a word that was only used for the slave. A slave would, would be lowly, and the word was lowliness. They would be lowly and bow their head, keep their eyes, never look upon their masters. Matter of fact, it was a word that was not found in the Latin or the Greek vocabulary. It was, many people believe, it was a word that was coined by the Christian, perhaps even by the Apostle Paul. Because he could find no other word that would so fit the, the picture of what a Christian should be like in his walk with the Lord as being lowly, as being humble. And the idea was, uh, it's just the opposite of pride. On one hand, a Christian should not promote a false humility. But it's one that should be lowly. And so Paul emphasizes the fact that we need to be humble because of unity. Pride is the opposite of that. But if, we're, if we have a humility, then there's a unity. Then he, then he uses the word gentle or gentleness or literally uh, meekness in verse 2. He talks about the, the, op- the opposite of self-assertion. It's the opposite of rudeness and the opposite of, of, uh, of harshness. Just really being uh, surrendered to the Lord and understanding who he is and being very humble in our approach to the things of God. One of the quotes I'll give you from one of the articles I read, harsh people are never wise people. They may be smart, they may even be right, but they're not what the Bible calls wise. So the idea is that, that we're not to be harsh in our approach to the things of God. We're to, be, we're to be right. We're to be gentle in what we're doing. We're to have self-control. I was talking with Sydney this week about the message, and uh, she had just finished up a study on the book of James, a Beth Moore study in James. She facilitated that. and was talking about a gentleness. And let me, let me read to you what, uh, what one of, what, an article from their workbook. The Greek word rendered gentleness 
is referring to a quality of not being overly impressed by the sense of one's self-importance. And uh, somebody else wrote, Doug Moo uh, notes that the quality uh, was, was not usually prized by the Greeks because they thought it uh, something that was unworthy of a strong and confident person. And it goes on in the notes, it said, things are not so different in our society today, are they? Even within our church community, the wise people are usually outspoken. The ones winning the theological debates. You know, the apologetics type who can devastate all their theological opponents. The gentle ones may be respected as good down to earth uh, with servant hearts, but we rarely deem them wise. What is it about not being overly impressed by the sense of one's self-important that makes one wise? If I were really courageous enough to admit it, I'm not as sufficient as I think I am, then I would, wouldn't always need to have the last word. In my woundedness and in my flesh, I delude myself into thinking that harshness and, and uh, severity are worth it if another person is fortunate enough to gain my superior perspective. Wrong. The gentleness that is linked to wisdom in the context of the book of James means living out the knowledge that I am not the priority here. When I combine this disquieting yet liberating truth about me with the awareness that, that each person I meet is worth far more than I could ever imagine, perhaps I will be on my way to exuding the wisdom from above. So there is the gentleness the Scripture speaks about. Then it talks about a long-sufferingness. A, the Greek word is long-tempered or to have patience. So here we find that, as James even says, that we're to be patient. James chapter 5 talks about uh, having a patient spirit that endures even unto the end. It, it endures all adversity. So this whole idea of having the attitude of humility and gentleness and patience fosters a unity among believers. And notice what he says. He said we're to bear with one another in love that is continuous and that is unconditional, this love that we are to have. And then verse 3, he uses the word uh, in, in uh, uh, chapter 4, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The word endeavoring is used in the King James, and the word simply means to try. You look up in the dictionary, and that's what it is. But the Greek word is deeper than that. And the ESV really has it correct when it uses the word eager. And, and the idea that Paul is getting across, he said, we're to, we're to make every diligent effort with eagerness to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. He said we need to be eager in what we're doing. You see, it's not just a duty. It's something that, that is uh, in our heart that we're to, we're to strive after constantly. Again, quoting from uh, Beth Moore, he said, we do love to talk about peace, don't we? Now, James, uh, James talks about peace, and Paul in Ephesians says that we're to do this in the third verse, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. He said we love to talk about peace, but do we actually sow in peace? Do we promote peace and remove divisiveness from our communities? Or do we secretly like to stir it up? More often than not, we ran about peace as a distant concept, like peace for the Middle East. But then at home, we cannot even resolve conflict with specific people in our lives, such as our spouses, our parents, our neighbors, our church members. Our tendency so often is to champion some kind of abstract notion for peace for the masses, all the while failing to bring peace to specific people we encounter in our daily lives. Moreover, causing disharmony in the community for one's own self-gain is earthly and not heavenly wisdom. And the scripture says that we are to seek this harmony, this unity in the spirit of peace. But notice something else. Christians do not make unity. When we've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, he took from all types of communities. He takes people that were raised in Christian homes. He takes people that were drunkards. He takes people that were uh, very loose in their lifestyle. He'll take druggies, and he'll, he'll, they'll, he'll save them and puts them in the family of God from all different backgrounds and puts them in the family of God for unity. Now, notice what the Scripture says. He says in that, in that uh, third verse, we are not to make unity, but it says that we're to keep Keep unity. We're to guard this unity that God has created when he made us one man in Christ Jesus. 
So this community that we have, this church that we have, the local church, the church at Ephesus, uh, the church at, at Thyatira, the church at Normal, whatever it is, the local churches, they have this spirit of unity because of what we have in Jesus Christ. So we are eager. Why are we eager in our lives to make sure that we have the spirit of unity, that we have it under peace because the Holy Spirit of God indwells us? Do you realize this morning that when you tear down or you criticize another believer that you are attacking this passage of scripture that you are saying I don't care what you say Apostle Paul I'm going to do my own thing because I think I'm right that's the whole idea of gentleness or the or the opposite of gentleness being harsh he said that's not to be what you are as a church that's not to be what you are as a christian but you're to be humble you're to be gentle you're to be long-suffering because of this spirit this unity that we have in the bond of peace why is this unity important he tells us in verse four there is one body and one spirit just as you are called in the one hope of your calling one lord one faith, one baptism, one God, the Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. He's, there's the Trinity that's in that passage. John Wolverd said this, the Trinity is an integral part of this list. The one body of believers is vitalized by one spirit. Spirit is capital S, and that's the Holy Spirit. It's not talking about the spirit of unity and so forth. It's talking about the Holy Spirit. So we're vitalized by one spirit, so all believers have one hope. And that body is united to its one Lord, Christ, by each member, one's act of faith, and its identity with him is depicted by one baptism, one God the Father is supreme over all, operative through all, and resides in all. So he's talking about one, sp one uh, spirit, one Son, one Savior, one Lord, and one God, God the Father. So it brings it together as we are in him. There's an article or a commentary that James Montgomery Boyce wrote, and he talks about this one spirit. Ephesians 4.4, 4, Paul's not saying that we're one spirit in the sense of enthusiasm or goal, but we have the work of the Holy Spirit. There's the awakening to sin. There's the work of, redem of regeneration. There's the work of faith, and there's the sanctification of the Holy Spirit separating us to a life unto God, making us love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, faith, uh, gentleness, meekness, uh, temperance against us. There, there is no like. It talks about the gifts, the nine gifts of the Spirit that, that he gives us. And so we have this one uh, this one hope in him, uh, one spirit. And then we have one hope. Boyce goes on and says, hope is, is, has suffered in the English language. It's not like it was in New Testament times. Today, hope usually means something uncertain, something perhaps wistfully thinking, but we do not really expect. The Bible idea is different. We have only at, uh, now in earnest a down payment of the Holy Spirit, the possession of the Holy Sp Spirit as proof of what is to come. And what he's saying is that when we trusted Christ, Ephesians 1 says, we've trusted Christ, we have the Holy Spirit of God, that's the down payment. That's the idea God gives us and said, this is what it will be like. This is just a taste. This is just a taste of what it will be like when you're complete in him. Ephesians 1, 12, 13, and 14. That's our hope that we have in him. After dealing with the basis of unity, Paul then goes into the seventh verse and describes the, this whole doctrine of unity that has a twin truth, and that twin truth is diversity. He says in verse 7, But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. So we have the unity of the Spirit, but each of us have been gifted by God. Your gift, your gift, yours, yours, and mine will be different. But it, it says that God gives it the measure of Christ's gift. It talks about the different gifts that God gives the believer in, in, the, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So in this unity, Paul says there is diversity. Every one of us has a particular role. The problem that we have is that when somebody doesn't like their role that the Spirit of God has given them, and they try to infringe upon somebody else's role, and that's not going to work because God puts together the church. God gives the gifts to individuals. He gives all, every believer here is gifted. Some of you have not discovered your gifts yet. Some of you have, have them dormant in your life. Some of you have not exercised them fully. And some of you have. 
but they're the gift that, that God's given us, and we use them for the ministry, for his work. And then in verse 8, he gives us a quote from uh, Psalm 68. Uh, it's, it's really a, a combination of the entire psalm, though part of verse 18 is there. He says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. So we realize that in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12, they're gifts to the believers. But here he's talking about gifted men to the church. He says in verse 9, now this he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also first descended in the lower parts of the earth. He who descended also is the one who ascended far above the heavens, that is, that he might fill all things. Talking about Christ. First descended, refers to the incarnation, and then it says that he descended to the lower parts of the earth, his death and burial, and then he ascended above uh, the clouds to heaven, and that's Jesus Christ reigning. Then he talks about the gifts that we have. Verse 11, he said, And he himself gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should be no longer children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of plotting of, deceit, of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love, that may grow up in all things into him who is the head, even Christ, for whom the whole body joined and knitted together by what every joint supplies according to the effect of working by which every part does its share causes growth in the body for the edifying of itself in love. So he talks about five gifted people that are given to the church. He talks about the apostles and the prophets. The apostles means one that was sent with authoritative, as, a, as an authoritative delegate. An apostle, one that learned under the feet of Jesus. Paul said, I'm an apostle out of due season, out of due time. Prophets were, in the New Testament prophets, up until the canon was completed, the New Testament prophets would give the teaching of the word of God. They would give the truths of the scripture. They would uh, uh, help reveal God's will to the church. And so you had the, the apostles and the prophets. The evangelists, we talk today about evangelists going from church to church. In the biblical sense, an evangelist would be more like a missionary. As missionaries go out and establish, and establish and, and churches and move on. Uh, they were itinerant preachers and went to groups of people. And then there were the pastors, teachers, same uh, character, two characteristics for the same person. And these were the ones that had uh, uh, went to established congregations, like Titus. Paul had Titus to a particular church. And Timothy pastored a particular church. And these were the pastors. These were the ones that would shepherd, they would comfort, and they would teach the things, the truths, the doctrines of the things of God. So he's talking about these gifts that are given to the church. We have in the, the day and age in which we live, we, the apostles are gone, the, the prophets are gone. They, since the first century, the church, uh, the canon was complete through in the, and actually into the, into the third and fourth century. Uh, you have evangelists, a little different uh, twist than what they did in Scripture, but nothing, nothing wrong with that. And then the pastor teachers <clears throat> that are in the local churches today, <clears throat> they are given by God. Every pastor is given by God. In a, uh, a few weeks, Pastor Josh will be here. And he's been given to us by God. So make no mistake about that. That being true, how do you plan to treat God's gift? Not only that, but we have a, a staff of pastors who have been given to us by God. So how do you treat God's gift? Somewhere in our thinking... We have come away with the idea that, that we have a senior pastor. I understand the, and how it works within our, in our churches, and we have uh, other pastors on staff, and sometime in our mind, we get thinking, well, the senior pastor has uh, uh, more credibility, or the senior pastor uh, is a uh, uh, higher calling, maybe w the word would be, of uh, somebody that's not a senior pastor. And we kind of look at it, well, here's this group, and then here's the senior pastor. Biblically, that's not correct. We look at each one as, as he is given by God. Now, one may have different responsibilities, but each one's been given by God. It's a gift of God 
to the local church. How do you treat the gift that God has given? Then verse 12 through verse 16 gives us the intention of the gift, unity of the faith, knowledge of the Son of God, that's a deeper walk with the Lord, to have a perfect or mature man, that's spiritual growth, to the fullness of Christ that reflects the qualities of Jesus reflected within our lives. And the reason in verse 14 through 16 that we already read <clears throat> that believers should not be immature believers. They should not be carried about by every false doctrine. Something comes along and they follow. I was talking with uh, Larry Anderson the other day and we were talking about the era in which we grew up back in the, in, in the Christian faith. Back in the early six, in the 60s and 70s, when, when uh, you accepted what was said uh, just because somebody that you liked said it. And so we, we lockstep with that. And we talked about just the idea of the Vietnam War and Watergate changed the whole perspective of, of trust and everything, and we question everything. And, and the idea that, that uh, we get into the Word and let the Word of God. And, and sometimes people follow false doctrine because they don't know any better, because somebody they love or somebody respect has said that without really getting into the word and letting the word of God speak to your heart and let the word of God challenge you. So let the word speak to you, let the word challenge you and take the word uh, as, as literal and take it part of your life. That's the reason we have pastors and teachers. We understand what sin is because it's pointed out to us in the word of God. Paul then compares the church to the body, everything working together for the sake of the gospel. And as I talked about last week, letting the lamp stand in Revelation chapter 1 shine in our life. All right, pastor, that's the teaching, but what does it mean to me? What can I take and apply to my life? I'll give you three things. First of all, every believer is part of the body of Christ. Now we say that, but we need to understand that. Because that is the unity. That's where it comes in. Every believer is part of the body of Christ. All of it. Every believer. My dad was in World War II, South Pacific. He, uh, I, he was in the 1st Marine Division, the scout. There were 120 of them. When he went to Camp Lejeune, they called to set guys aside. And they were basically taking athletic people because these were the guys that had to be able to run and they expect them to, to really get out. And so he was one of the 120 uh, first of the first on the islands to scout them out and go back and, and give a report. He was on Peleliu, and they were a group of five in a foxhole, and, and a grenade comes in. And each of these guys came from all parts of the country, and they were all concerned about themselves and their family, but together as they were there in a unit. And there was a, a foxhole, and there was a grenade that was thrown in, and they were scrambling, and Dad landed on top of the grenade couldn't move. The other guys were all around. If it had gone off, he'd have, been, he'd have been gone. It was a dud. It didn't go. But these guys were thinking ab about each other. And that's the unity, really, that you have within the church. We're in a foxhole together, and we're fighting the devil. And what we're, so often we do is we take one believer and throw him out, and other we don't like the way he dresses or what he does or what she says or whatever, what, how they look, and throw him out. Don't like what they, what, what, how they conduct themselves, and we throw him out. And that's not the unity that the apostle's speaking about. There's the unity together in Nehemiah. You talk about Sam Battle and these guys coming against, against the Jews as they were rebuilding the walls. They were doing so, coming from different sections, but the people got together and they had an implement of, of, of battle in one hand and they worked with the other. But they were just simply together because they had a battle. That's exactly what, what uh, uh, Paul is talking about in our text, in our scripture. Just reading <clears throat> again uh, Boyce's commentary or messages on Ephesians. And he gave an illustration, he talked about a story in there with, uh, uh, that somebody else had given. And uh, the idea that we think along the line someplace, I've heard these conversations, where people say, <clears throat> you know that... Uh, uh, I follow Jesus, and the Lord wants me to do this or doesn't want me to do that. And because you do, I'm sorry, I can't have part of that because that's not the Jesus I follow, as if there are two Jesus. But that's, that's the way we, we look at things so often. Or I don't, I don't follow that kind of Jesus. You, you, your Jesus may allow you to do that, but my Jesus doesn't, so I'm, I'm not going to do it. What's, what's that? That's, that's our society. That's, that's how divisive that we've come in Bible Christianity. I'm talking about people that love the Lord. 
and people that want to serve him, but they're, they're divisive on so many issues that there's not two Jesus. That we, we follow, that's what Paul said here, there's one Lord. There's an illustration that was given, <clears throat> and I'll take some liberty with it, but there was an illustration, and, and an imaginative uh, conversation between the man that was healed uh, was, was blind and Jesus healed him in John chapter 9 and the man that was healed of blindness in Mark chapter 8. They're in a conversation with each other and they're giving their testimony to a group of people. John chapter 9, man, uh, Jesus spit upon the ground and he took the uh, spittle, the mud, put in his eyes, went to the pool and washed and he was able to see. Mark chapter 8, man, Jesus uh, put some spittle upon his eyes, and he said, open your eyes, and they said, I see men as tree walking. Jesus laid his hand on him, and he was healed. <clears throat> so John 9 says to Mark 8, he said, I want you to just give a testimony about what God's done. Hey, I'd be glad to. And these group of people around, and, and Mark 8 says, you know, he said, I was, I was uh, blind, and some of my friends, Jesus was coming through Bethsaida, and, and some of my friends took me to him, and, and Jesus touched me, and I'm healed. And John 9 says, that's tremendous. That's just a wonderful thing. That, but you forgot, you forgot to tell them about the, about the mud in the eyes and going to the, going to the pool and wash. He said, no, he said, well, that didn't happen to me. You know, I, Jesus, Jesus just touched me. Now, wait a second. Now, I know how the Lord works. I know how he worked in my life, and I know the plan of God. And God, Jesus spit upon the ground and took the mud and put it in my eyes, and, and I went to the pool. And you forgot to tell that part. That never happened to me. John 9 digs his heels into the ground. He says, no, wait a second. There's something the matter here. Either you're a dirty liar, or you're not, you're not, you're not able to see. You're just faking this whole thing. So he said, there has to be something the matter with that. And they argue with each other, and that was the beginning of the Muddites and the anti-Muddites. That's what takes place in Christianity. You know what happens? We get focusing upon the method of how the Lord works, and we forget to focus upon the Lord that works. We get, how does God work? God, God has done this in my life and God has done this in my ministry or God has done this in my church, so this is the way it's gotta be. And we get focusing on the method. That's not the method we used in the 60s. That's not the method we used in the 70s. And that's, look what God did. And so why are we thinking that's gonna be like that in the, in the, the 21st century? What's, what's with this? And we focus upon the method and we forget the God of the method, and we don't focus upon him, and we get all messed up. Every believer is part of the body of Christ. Secondly, every believer needs to have the same focus. Dallas Willard wrote a book called Divine Conspiracy. In the book, he talks about the gospel of sin management. There's nothing wrong with sin management. But that's not an end to itself. And that's what he says within the book. And let me illustrate it this way. And section three of the NFL standard player contract stipulates in part, and I quote, player will not engage, player's name will not engage in any activity other than football which may involve a significant risk of personal injury. The player's name therefore agrees that the club will have the right to enjoin the player from engaging in any activity other than football which may involve a significant risk of injury, end quote. Sometimes they'll include motorcycles, they'll include skydiving or, or whatever. Those guys are paid huge salaries so they can throw a football or a baseball or catch something or, or uh, shoot a basket or block or tackle, whatever the sport is, they're paid that great amount of money and th those guys are done so in order to make sure that they can do the do's, that they can hit the ball, they can catch the ball, whatever it is. They're paid that money to make sure they can do the do's. They're under contract to make sure they don't do the don'ts. And that's what really Christianity is. <clears throat> Tom Mercer made this statement, being obedient just makes it possible for us to do what we're under contract to do. What are we under contract to do? 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own? You are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. You are bought with a price. That's a contract. We accepted that contract. 
And so obedience simply makes it possible for us to do what we're under contract to do. We don't come to church simply to make sure we become less and less sinful. That's not why we're here. Oh, it can help us not to sin. It can help us to to determine what's true and needs to be in our life. Positionally, I am righteous in the sight of God through Jesus Christ. Practically, I struggle with sin every day just like you do. And that becomes the battle of our life. The day from the day that I trusted Jesus Christ, August 31st in 1958, until the day I go in his presence, God has something incredible for me to do as well as you. When we got saved, God did not save us and take us to heaven immediately because there's a purpose he has for us upon planet Earth. Are we fulfilling his purpose? Thirdly, every believer must be willing to lay it all on the line. Our founding fathers were willing to give their lives, their fortune, and their sacred honor. Founders of Calvary Baptist Church signed over their homes in order to be able to get the money in order to establish this church and to be able to build the building. Two questions. What are you willing to do for your church? What is it? First, there is a, there's a first generation mentality and a second generation mentality. First generation mentality, <clears throat> people get saved. They're excited about the things of God as many of you have done to get saved. And boy, this is great. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna, I'm, how can I help? What can I do? And, and there's that, that involvement, the excitement. Second generation, you've been, uh, you or family was saved. Uh, you grew up in Christianity. And there's the tendency that, that that pioneer spirit's not there. You love the Lord. You serve the Lord. But, but sometimes your commitment is not as strong to the local church as first generation. Needs to be, but sometimes it's not. There are all kinds of things that, that can play within our, in our lives and our thoughts. So what are we doing for our church? And then the second question is, what are we doing for our God? And that's more important. I don't think there's a conflict. I think if we're, if we're really surrendered to the Lord, then we understand the importance of what the church is, what my involvement in the church needs to be. But what is your commitment to the Lord? As we go through this transition in the next several weeks, what is your, what's your commitment to the Lord? What's your commitment to the church? How are you gonna be involved? Are you gonna be the one that sits back and says, all right, well, just wait and see. And with a divisive spirit, it can be. Say, bless God, we're, we, this is what we've done in the past, this is what we can do in the future, and the future's brighter than the past as it always is, and this is what we can accomplish, and let's roll up the sleeves, and let's have that, that first-generation mentality. Let's get busy and do what God wants us to do and build upon what we have. What's our attitude? What are we going to do for God? What are we going to do for the church becomes our responsibility.